All right. So today is September 23rd at about 8.45. We're going to start with the first class of PTA 202 Rehab 2. Um, so Rehab 2 is going to heavily function and look at neurological-based patients. That's why a lot of times Rehab 2 and most, that's um, the word I'm looking for, most uh, programs, there we go, that's the word I was looking for, most programs is considered neuro rehab. Uh, a lot of times I always question why they move neuro rehab kind of the semesters that they're in because when you go on clinical rotations, a lot of your patients are neuro patients. And it's kind of weird that we don't send you out like on your first rotation with a little bit of neuro. And I always wondered that too when I was a student, why did, why did we do that? Because this doesn't make sense to me and blah, blah, blah. And then I took neuro rehab and I'm like, oh, that's why they did that because I would have had no idea if I had not seen that patient. So that's kind of where this comes into play. So we're gonna look at function and assessment of function. So before we start, I thought I'd start off with some good old humor because this is me. Uh, you know, I, I just found some good humor for the morning. I hope that some of you like, I really like the, uh, what's the favorite paradox? He asked at Rick Astley for his copy of the movie up. He cannot give, give it to you as he'll never give you up. But however, in doing so, he always lets you down, thus creating the Astley paradox. I thought that was amusing, but Jared's like, oh God. And I really like, I'm going to definitely use the ant one later because it's very physics related. You can tell the sex of an ant by dropping in the water. If it sinks, it's a girl ant. If it floats, it's a boy ant. Huh? 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 I'll be here all week. Buoyant, buoyant meaning float. Uh -huh, see, I tried dating an anesthesiologist, but the relationship didn't work. The breakup was painless, though. Eh, 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 eh. Actually, I sprayed body spray in my mouth. I now talk with an accent. <laughs> And the last one, I actually saw this sign. This, uh, one of the my neighbors back in Pennsylvania had this sign. Entrance to the field is free, but the bull will charge later. I like that one. That was that was one of the amusing ones that I actually saw from Pennsylvania. It was kind of funny that I saw that when I was looking for some fun stuff today. But see, you missed my jokes. You couldn't deal without them. Just imagine that my patients have to deal with this the whole time I'm working with them, right? They, they do get tired of it. So we're going to talk about function and activity levels, right? So what is our ultimate goal of any rehab program, right? Our ultimate goals when we're doing it is to get a patient to return to normal. That's a very broad term, right? Better term for that is we want to return them to a pre-morbid level of function. What would pre-morbid level of function mean? Premorbid means what? Yeah, prior level of function. So that's going to mean before they were whatever, before they were sick, before they had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, before they had MS. We want to try to get them to that level. But unfortunately, right? Unfortunately for that, not always can we do that. You know, I, I have a really, really good friend that works in hand therapy. I think you've heard me talk before about this. And she really, really has a problem with this because she wants to fix everybody. She's a really, really good therapist. But in her head, she wants to make everyone 100% better. Is that possible? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not fun. Is it possible to return everybody back? What do you think, Dara? Is it possible? Call people out this morning. Wake them up. It's not, it's not 100 pos, it's not, no, right? Let's take a look at my, I'm gonna use myself as an example. When the patient broke my neck and my neck was fractured in those three places, 
I was probably the worst patient because I kept dwelling on the fact that I couldn't do the stuff I could do before I broke my neck. And I had to do the same thing I tell my patients. I can't compare myself to what I did prior to my injury. I had to compare myself to what I did yesterday, what I did the day before that. Because the likelihood of me having full function back is pretty much zero. I've got a fusion, right? So I don't have full right rotation. It's not there. Left rotation, I'm pretty good with. But at right rotation, it's pretty shy. So what do we do then if we can't do that? Well, then we have to maximize their current potential for function and further maintain that function. So uh, Erica had mentioned she saw a mother and daughter with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, right? There's no way to return them to premorbid function. Patients got MS. We can't necessarily get them back yeah, some of the patients are clinicals, right? It's, it's kind of sad because you want your heart, in your heart, you're like, I want to help you. And it's hard to get over the fact that you can't always help somebody and get them back to 100%. It's really frustrating and it just makes you kind of sad. But what you have to do is go, I'm going to make them as good as I possibly can. So how do we do that? Well, we compensate for loss, right? Let's say you have somebody that was over in Afghanistan and stepped an IED and had their whole right leg blown off. Is there any way you're gonna get them back to absolutely before like they were before they had the, they stepped in that IED? Yeah, no, we don't have, like, we're not in um, one of my favorite shows, The Expanse. We don't have these growth stim patches that we can stick on them. We're not Deadpool, we can't regrow legs right? So that leg is gone. No matter what we do, that leg's gone. Maybe both legs are gone for all we know. So what we have to do then is learn how to compensate, teach them how, you know, yeah, you've lost those limbs, but we can get you moving again, right? And it's amazing, especially if you work in the VA system, how many soldiers lose a limb and are ready, to, you know, in a couple of weeks to go back out there. Right, they're, they're gung-ho, ready to go and get back out there. And our job is to get them as close to being able to go out as possible. We also have to maximize and maintain their current level of function, right? One of the battles we face, especially with progressive diseases, is that progressive downslide. Like primary progressive MS, which we're going to talk about in a few classes, it doesn't get better. It will only get worse. ALS is another great example of that. It's only going to get worse. Huntington's disease, another great example of it. It's only going to get worse. We don't have cures for them. And honestly, looking at the way some of them work at the DNA level, I doubt we'll ever have a pure cure for it, right? Exactly, right? Yeah, that's a great point. So Clary said, you know, once she had an MS patient that told her that once they fall, they're afraid to get up because they are scared of doing it again. It's exactly right, right? You put that fear. Even if they don't have MS, if you get an older lady or an older gentleman who's 65 plus and they fall, and even if they don't break their hips, which unfortunately happens way too often, um, the, the patient gets this fear of walking, right? Because they're like, oh my God, I fell last time. And so what's that going to cause them to do? Yes, yeah, sit more. Exactly, Erica, right? So they're going to become more sedentary. And because they become more sedentary, right, that vicious cycle starts happening. Because they're more sedentary, they become weaker. So they become more likely to fall. So they fall again, which makes them become more sedentary, which causes them to become weaker, which causes them to fall more. So they get in that really vicious thought cycle. Whereas we can come in and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, it's horrible that you fell, but how about we stop focusing on the fall and start focusing on how we can prevent you from falling? Right? Maximize your level of function and then prevent that further decline. ALS is a great example. If you ever work with patients that have ALS, it's very heartbreaking um, for kids, right? The, um... oh, why am I drawing a blank right now? Muscular dystrophy, there we go. Muscular dystrophy, same idea, right? They're just gonna waste away on you. 
Uh, just watched uh, another uh, thing on Steve Gleason the other day and just saw how much he's gone downhill. So Steve Gleason, does everyone know who Steve Gleason is? I think I talked about him before. So Steve Gleason was a former football player for the uh, New Orleans Saints. And quite possibly the bane of my existence initially because he played in the football game where it was the first football game back in the Superdome prior to or after Katrina came through. And the Falcons were winning and they're actually winning pretty good. And on a punt, he broke through the punt and blocked it and they scored. And from then on, the New Orleans Saints went on to just run rough shot over us and won the game in the end. It was kind of almost like it might've been fixed, but I'm not gonna say that, right? But, you know, here he is, healthy, whole, hearty football player. And then now he's confined to a wheelchair and he has no motion whatsoever in his extremities. He can only move by using eye movements and he's got an eye movement voice tracker and stuff like that. He's never gonna get better. Right. He's at the point in the disease where the process is eventually going to kill him. He's going to die from probably pneumonia or something to that effect or bed sores. But we can try to help prolong his life and maintain his level of function longer, at least so that he can have a little bit better of a life. We focus a lot in physical therapy on quality of life, right? You'll hear QOL quite commonly. But equally, we kind of have to focus on quality of death. It is kind of making you sad. I know. Well, wait till we get to the, the, the actual functional measurements. It'll make you sadder because you want to kind of stab your eyes. So we look at health. What does health mean to you? Well, health means a little bit to all of us, right? A little different thing. The who, right, are you, says that a state, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease or infirmity. I really like that definition because what it's saying is you can be healthy and still have a disease, right? Just because you have MS, one of my best friends has MS, right? Just because he has MS doesn't mean he's not healthy. He can still be very healthy as long as he takes care of his three pillars, right? The physical, mental, and social well-being. He chooses not to let his disease define him. We used to consider somebody that was not healthy as somebody that had some form of disease, right? Now, let's think about this for a second. You get the flu. Are you healthy when you get the flu? What do you think, AJ? Yeah, no, you're not, right? Well, why is that? Well, because your physical, mental, and social well-being goes down. Right, you're no longer at your prior level of function for all those. Right, some people maybe their social well being stays up and they're trying to spread it to everybody. Right, but man, waiting for the pop quiz. <laughs> I love it. I got y'all paranoid now. This complete physical, mental, and social well being is there, but when you're sick, it's not right. Men especially, I hate to say it, guys, but we are absolutely 100% predisposed to this, right? When we get the flu, we, we tend to be a little bit of baby. I'm going to generalize here, but I've had it, and I know, right? We, we get the man flu. We're just completely, uh, right? We can chop off our hands sometimes and be completely functional, but we get the flu and forget it. We chop off our hand like, oh, duct tape will fix that. But then we get the flu and we're like, I don't feel good. It's just funny, right? But that's because our, phys our physical and our mental well-being are shot at that point and we need to get over that a little bit. We could still theoretically be functional with the flu, right? I've known plenty of people that still run and still exercise at home when they have the flu, but you know, they're not purely healthy at that point. So illness is the deviation from the normal state of health or wellness or the deviation for homeostasis, right? And homeostasis is that kind of neutral feeling where everything is in alignment. It is a bio disease comes with illness, right? Disease is a biomedical condition. It's substantiated by objective data. When this pandemic started kicking in, 
we couldn't officially say this was a new disease yet because we didn't have objective data showing us that this was a novel virus, right? And you kept hearing that term that this was a novel coronavirus. Does anyone know what novel meant? It meant that it was like war and peace, right? Yeah, new. Exactly, Erica and Zach, right? It's a new virus, right? It, there's no way that a previous presidency could have prepared us for this. There's no way a previous CDC could have prepared us for this because this is a new virus. We couldn't have had any precautions in place for this. And we could have had some, could have had some preparation in place, but we couldn't have had a, vir a virus vaccine. We couldn't have had therapeutics for this because we really didn't know. Right? The way this disease affects us and the way that our last kind of major outbreak with swine flu affects us are totally different diseases. So we can't use similar treatments for both of those. You know, a lot of the antivirals work really well with swine flu. With the novel coronavirus, it's not working as well, right? They still work, but they're definitely not as effective. How do we find out? Well, we had to look at the objective data. They had to look at this virus under a microscope. They had to study a certain amount of people and see what that R naught is, how disease, how effective that disease is at spreading, right? Now, illness also refers to that kind of personal behavior that we take on when we realize we have a disease and we internalize it and start experiencing it for ourselves. And if you've ever been in a room when a patient is given a cancer diagnosis, you'll see the state of illness take on right as it happens. Because all of a sudden their health goes down without even knowing if that cancer is, right, it's the worst feeling ever, exactly, Adrian. That their health will go down immediately and maybe the cancer is completely benign and doesn't has not, you know, it's not going to kill them. But you get that diagnosis of cancer. And what's the first thing you think of as soon as you hear cancer? Death, right? I'm going to die. And when you get that kind of disease mindset, everything goes downhill from there, right? And that kind of puts you on this snowballing path. So when we look at function and physical therapy, Again, looking at the ICF and looking at what the Hugh has written, function is an umbrella term encompassing all body functions, structures, activities, and participation. It requires everything kind of coming together, your brain, your social affect, your effective abilities at doing things, your motor skills, sleeping, eating, walking, talking, um, having sex, getting a shower, driving a car, all of that requires function. Right? You have to be able to do certain things for all of those. And our function can be affected in various different ways, right? Because let's say you break a leg, God forbid. Right? You break a leg, going to the grocery store is going to be affected, right? It's going to be affected because now you maybe can't walk or you know, you're not good at walking, so it's going to take you a lot longer. But just the same... If you get depression, so you get a mental effect, so that cognitive effect starts kicking in, you may have very similar problems with going to the grocery store, right? It may take you longer to walk around the grocery store. Um, you may not want to go. But when you look at that, the overall effect on function is the same, right? You just stopped going to the grocery store. You stopped hanging out with friends. Maybe you stopped showering, and that's why you stopped hanging out with friends. So disability, it's a term that gets tossed around a lot, right? And in our country, unfortunately, disability has a negative connotation because certain folk, when they hear disability, what they hear is takers. What do I mean by that? What do you think? I, yeah, using the system, exactly. Now. You're exactly right, Erica. Are there people that use the system, that gain the system? Absolutely. Here's the deal. No matter what you do, doesn't matter if it's you're the most perfect 
you know, society in the world. You know, you go back to ancient Rome and look at how utopian ancient Rome was. I'm going to use utopian in quotes because it may not have been utopian for everybody. There's still going to be people gaming the system. Right? We could be in a we could be in, I mean, look at Star Trek as a great example of it for those of you that are Trekkies in here and all hail Dr. Reskin being the greatest Trekkie in the world. You look at Star Trek and you look at the Federation of Planets, right? And they have a utopia. They have no money in that society. Think about how great that would be. That you never have to worry about money. Right? How would that feel? Would that probably improve your health? Sounds a bit like communism to me. <laughs> well, in a way, I mean, I wouldn't say communism, but more Marxism. Um, because it is. It's it's a very utopian society that they built in the Star Trek community, right? But what the Star Trek community, when you look at Star Trek and if you look at the ethos behind the Federation, is that Gyra is working for the betterment of me. I am working for the betterment of Erica. Erica is working for the betterment of Gyra. Everyone is moving forward to improve the betterment of everybody. Now, are there going to be some people that don't do as much because they're getting everything handed to them? Sure. Right? But you, you can't base your whole thought process on those people. Because if you do, you get a dysfunctional system. Right? So disability, according to the WHO, again, says that it's a term that encompasses impairments in body functions and structures, activities, limitations, and participation restrictions. Uh, Dr. Avreskin says, hello to you all, and she can't wait to see it tomorrow. Um, so looking at that, body function structures, activities, limitation, participation restrictions, those all come into play. We're going to talk about those when we talk about the ICF coming up here. So thinking about this, right? Does our current health care and Social Security Administration classify people by their health, disability, illness, or their function level? What do you think? How do we classify people? Do we classify them by how healthy they are? This is an open question. There's not a right or wrong answer here. I, you know, I think we could be better at that, Adrian. I think we classify people more on their disability and their illness rather than how healthy they are. Right, BMI, right, exactly. All of those are gonna come into play, right? Insurance carriers. Theoretically, insurance carriers can affect your rate based upon how healthy you are. And what they're not saying, they're saying how healthy you are. What they're really saying is how many pre-existing conditions do you have? Are you a smoker? Are you obese? Do you have previous history of heart disease, right? Have any of you ever gotten, have any of you applied for life insurance recently? Yes, there we go, Sakana, right? Life insurance. So Sakana, Kelly, right? Michelle, when you apply for life insurance, there's a certain level you can get where they don't require any information, right? Like about $10,000. And I'll say from experience over the past, was it about the past little past year and a half with losing quite a bit of my family? Ten thousand dollars doesn't go very far when we're talking about um, taking care of funeral expenses and stuff like that, right? So they go higher, then they're like, okay, well we need blood work, well we need this, well we need that. What are they actually doing when they're getting all that information? Does anyone know what that's called? There's a term for it in the insurance industry. Vetting's a good, good thought process. It's called risk assessment. So what they're literally doing is going, okay, so we have Erica, and Erica's fairly healthy, right? She does exercise, her blood work looks good. And so the likelihood of her dying in the next 10 years for her life insurance policy is really low. So we'll give her a rate that's $15 a month per unit. So she'll get, you know, she wants to get $100,000, maybe $15 a month. Right, it may. I'm just using this as an example because you're the first one to respond to me. Now, same, same adjuster comes to me and goes, okay, Mr. McKeever, we're going to do your work up here. 
and they look and they're like, oh, your cholesterol is kind of borderline. Oh, you've got some history of some heart issues. Your family medical history is the history of heart issues. Well, now they're going to go, the likelihood of him dying in 10 years, especially not even talk about the age difference, right? The likelihood of me dying in 10 years is a lot greater than Erica. So now, well, maybe I'm going to get $100 for every unit, right? We classify people that way. And really what they're doing is Kelly's like, they're trying to up your rate. But this is what people forget about insurance because they think that they're the only one in this pool of insurance, but they're not. Insurance companies balance themselves by leveraging everyone against everyone. Meaning they, the money they take in from everyone kind of helps cover one person or that person that gets sick. Now, sadly in our society, insurance is pretty much a super for-profit industry, right? I mean like super for-profit industry. So people are making money off people dying, which is kind of sad. Uh, what do you think about disability? Could it differ upon employment? What's SES? You'll see that a lot in research lately. Does anyone know what SES? Socioeconomic status. Great answer, Adrian, right? So looking at how you, where you fit in society, where do you live? What does your money look like? What does your savings look like? Everything like that, that affects your health. Uh, location. Do you think disability can be different because of that? So let's think about this. Yeah, definitely, right? So let's think about this. Let's say I am a physical therapist assistant. I am, magically, I don't know how that happened. And I lose a pinky, right? I am sitting cutting up tomatoes one day and all of a sudden I'm like, whoosh, Oh, that's not good. My pinky's gone. Is that likely to keep me from working? Maybe for a bit, right? Once it heals, but eventually I can get pretty much back to overall normal function, right? I mean, the pinky is important, but let's face it. If I'm gonna lose a finger, that's the one I'm gonna pick, right? Ironically enough, you lose the baby toe and you'll find out how bad that, how much is used for balance. But yeah, so I lose my pinky, you know, I get over the healing process, everything gets stitched up, I get a nice clean wound on dressing on it, I can get back to work. Now let's say I'm a concert pianist and I lose a pinky. Are we at a different situation now? Yeah, right? So let's say that you're like on the, the cream of the crop, maybe on the president's band, the Marine Corps band and you lose that pinky, does that mean you can't play? No, you can still play. Started Doctor Strange, exactly, right? You can still play, but suddenly your life has changed forever because you might have to relearn everything you did, right? Doctor Strange is a great example of that. It's a fantastic example, right? Talented neurosurgeon that loses the ability to use his hands. Technically, at that point, he's disabled for his previous job, right? Now, nowadays, maybe not, because maybe now he can use a robot to do the stuff that he used to do with his hands, right? With the Da Vinci robots and all those fancy robots I got now. We might be getting to a point where that's not as big of a deal for surgeons, right? Maybe the surgeon starts getting a little bit of a Parkinson's shake or something like that, but they can still finish it because now they can program a robot to do their work, but it varies it. What about perception? You think perception affects disability? All right, so Michelle says, sure. Why do you think that, Michelle? Put you on the spot. I love my new teaching techniques. What do you think? How could perception affect disability? Yeah, I'll toss it out to anyone. What do you think? Yeah, how people look at you, right? To function, right? Let's, 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 I'm going to use myself as an example. When I broke my neck, I'm going to admit, you know, within that first three weeks when my left arm started just dying off and stopped functioning at all, 
Man, can you imagine what my perception was like? Like literally within three weeks, all sensation had died off and then my motor function started failing. And by four weeks, my arm was in a sling and that was all I could do. Right? Think about that for a second. Like it completely destroyed my perception of life. And I'm just, I literally, I finally could understand what a patient has gone through where they're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, my whole career is based upon this arm working. You know, luckily I didn't give up on that, but man, that perception could definitely be a killer. So looking at the biomedical medical model as clinicians, we tend to focus more on the disease and less on the individual. You hear this really common and probably if, I, if you look at some of these guys or some of these comments, you'll probably think, yeah, I heard that when I was at my clinical affiliation, right? The cerebral palsy kid, pulmonary embolus dude, the autistic kid, the diabetic, right? The total knee replacement. By labeling a person based upon their disease, they're going to internalize their disease. Right? So by calling them their disease, if I said my autistic friend, what that says to them is our friendship is transactionally based upon them being autistic. Think about that for a second. Just let that soak in. Think about how that can change your view, right? Um, I've had people, I've heard people before where they use, you know, they'll say stuff like, you know, they'll use ethnicity or race and call somebody their insert race friend here. So what they're really doing at that point is saying that their race is what defines that person. And that's not always true. Actually, I'd say I'd be likely to say that's never true, right? We're not defined by one characteristic of us, right? Now, change that up. The cerebral palsy kid. Could you say James and you know James, the the kid that has cerebral palsy, wanted a soda? Yeah, that's different. Now you're not calling him by his disease. You're saying that he does have that disease, but it's no longer the defining factor for him. Right? It's, it's just not good to talk to people by their disease. And the more you internalize your disease, you start taking on the psychosocial, social, and behavioral dimensions that accompany that illness. And it creates that illness behavior, right? Where they start, you know, they read about online on WebMD, which, oh my gosh, like I can't even imagine what the world would be like if we didn't have WebMD in the healthcare field. WebMD is just one of those things that has made our jobs a lot more difficult in healthcare world because somebody gets a diagnosis of MS, the first thing they're going to do is go Google it. And they go Google it and they start freaking out because one person died two years into having MS. And they're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. And so they start, start taking on that. So how can we as PTs and PTAs help change this behavior? How can we help keep them from being stigmatized? What do you think we can do to kind of help break them of this vicious cycle? Educate them, right? Good, great answer, Kelly, right? Educate them that they're not do it yourself is the big one, right? Educate them and I'm gonna be as guilty as the next person because I grew up in a time period in healthcare where this was normal, right? And we never thought how it could psychologically affect people. And it's kind of sad now. And I think about some of the, some of the ways I refer to people and it's not the best light, right? But we always do that as people, don't we? We always look back on our life and go, man, I hope I'm not defined by that one time that I did that stupid thing. I guarantee if we go around this room, all of us have that one story that, man, we wish we never did. Right, we're not perfect. We all make mistakes. And the key thing is, can we grow from that mistake, right? It's not the mistakes that we make, it's what we do to those mistakes, right? I, I, still one of my favorite, favorite phrases comes from the 1950s Batman comics, why do we fall? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up, right? 
the falling is not the problem. It's learning to do better. That's what we're going to try to do. So teach these patients. You are not your disease. You are John. You are Sue. You are Mary. You know, you're a concert pianist. You are a wonderful worker at, at Amazon. Whatever it may be, you're, and even your job doesn't define you. How many, how many of you guys know a friend that their job defines them? as who they are in the world. Does anyone know any of those people? Yeah, lots, right? Especially get into that financial sector. A lot of those people that work in the financial sector, their job defines them. Sometimes in the military, right, Michelle? A lot of those people in the military, their job defines them. Kind of gives them their sense of self-worth, right? You're, you're just a grunt. Ever hear that before? before? Definitely in the army, right? You're just a grunt, right? Was there a difference between just a grunt and a green beret? Yeah, hugely from the training standpoint. But does that make that green beret more, you know, how oh, it's term I want to use? More useful to society than the person that's, you know, just infantry? No, it doesn't, right? Because, you know, maybe that guy that's infantry has been trained as a field medic and all of a sudden you get in a car accident and he's on site and he keeps you from dying from bleeding out. Whereas the Green Beret comes on site and he has no idea what to do with you. Right? He's like, well, I'll put you down. Just joking. Green Berets would never do that. But yeah, right? We, our things don't define us. You guys made a decision in your life. You really did. Think about it. You said that your previous jobs and your previous lives are not going to define you. You are going to take the time and go back to school. Think about that for a second. You literally said my life was not going to be defined by where I was previously. I need to change my life. But equally, once you get become a PTA, you can't let becoming a PTA define you either. Right? I, I tend to do a little too much, I think, when I, with the, like volunteering and working and whatever else I do. But it doesn't define me. My work's not my only thing, right? I have a lot of fun stuff I do in my life, just not recently. So we're going to go through the Nagi and the ICF, and then we'll take a break real quick. So Nagi, do you guys remember talking briefly about this in PTA 110 and maybe in uh, Patho? All right, so here's the good news. What do you need to know about the Nagi? That it existed. That it was a thing, right? You need to know that it existed and that it was replaced by the ICF. We're gonna talk about the ICF next, right? But looking at the Nagi, let's look at this example of a patient. So we have a patient with progressive weakness presents with paralysis of the trunk and lower extremities. The patient is, what's DX mean? Diagnosed, good, excellent, Adrian. Diagnosed with the T12 spinal cord. Patient mobilized with standard wheelchair, requires moderate assistance for self-care. PLF, what's PLF again? People's Liberation Front? No, it's not that. Prior level of function, right? We'll go with prior level of function, poire. I like poire level of function. The poire level of function. The prior level of function, right? Is a FedEx driver. T12 spinal cord injury, does that change his ability to be a FedEx driver? Oh, yeah. Right? So hopefully his life is not defined by being a FedEx driver. So by the Nagi, we looked at it. His pathology is a spinal cord injury at T12. His impairment is loss of neurological function below T12. His functional limitation is unable to ambulate. Disability cannot continue to work. Boom, we've, put a, we've slapped the label on him, next. Right, does that define everything about him? Does that tell us what he can do? Not really. And we know that he moves the wheelchair. That's about all we know right now. Right, so this was a really rudimentary way of classifying disability. And we've really worked on improving this. Because yeah, we want to look at what they can do versus what they can't do. So then we got to the ICF, right? The International Classification, right? 
and now this looked at after some research who looked at what we can look at. So we have health conditions, we have body structure and function, activity, participation, environmental factors, and contextual factors. We're going to talk about this. So let me get my little friend back here. Come here, bungee bear. You're going to be my patient. All right. We have Mr. Bungee Bear here. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Yes, I've got issues, right? So sit up here on my shoulder, buddy. We'll talk about you in a little bit. Oh, you fell. We'll sit you on the desk. Sit down and relax, sir. We're going to use you in a minute. So with the ICF, we classify things in a couple different ways. We classify things based on body functions, right? And body functions are the systems of our body. So give me a system in our body. Skeletal system, great. Right. Any of those systems are going to fall under body functions. Now, body structures are the anatomical parts of the body. So give me a body structure. What do you think? ACL joint there. Great. Right. Well, AC joint would probably be better. ACL joint would be a little weird. The ACL would be a structure, though. Right. Impairments are the problems in that body's function, right? Usually significant deviation or loss. We're going to kind of walk through one of these real quick then. Activity is the execution of a task. Participation is what we do in life. So then an activity limitation is difficulty completing a task. Participation restriction is difficulty interacting with the outside world. And then we have environmental factors that we do have to take into account, right? So we got bungee bear here. And Bungie Bear has frozen shoulder. His right shoulder is frozen. So he's only got about 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. Oh no, Bungie Bear, poor Bungie Bear. What body function could be impaired causing that? So what system? Okay, the muscular system, are there any others? Could it be the bones themselves? Could it be the neuro, right? It could be the skeletal. So we got a couple there. Um, let me ask this. Could it be our cardiovascular? Yeah, right? So there's a lot of systems that could go into causing this bear to not be able to lift his arm. I'm going to say cardiovascular is not the problem because if he has a blood flow, I'm getting scared. Right? So his, his shoulder's limited. There's a lot of systems that could cause that. What body structure is impaired? What would the structure be called? Right, the glenohumeral joint. Good, right? The GH joint. That's my structure that's impaired. Oh no, I can't raise my hand to answer a question, Mr. McKeever. All right, so. How would we classify, how would we give an impairment or classify that body structure being having problems? How will we measure that? Because the impairments are going to be our measurements. Goniometry, great, right? So goniometry is a fantastic answer. What else could we use? Manual muscle testing, right? All those functions, internal, external rotation, flexion, abduction, horizontal add, horizontal abduction, all those functions, right? Measuring all of those will help us come up with what his impairments are. What activity limitations? Yes, the video is still going to be posted, Adrian. It's fine. Yep, don't worry about it. What activity limitations is he going to have because he can't lift his arm above 90 degrees? Washing his hair, right? He can't get up here and get his hair clean. Brushing his teeth, maybe. I can't do that. Maybe with a handle, maybe. Can't do the wave. Whoa! Reaching up on counters. So there are a lot of activity limitations he's going to have. Putting on a shirt, great. So he's going to walk around bare. Huh? 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 All right, so now he's got some participation or some activity limitations. What might he stop doing because he's had those participation restrictions? 
That's going to be our activity limitations. Well, showering is going to be an activity. So now think interacting with the world, because that's what the participation restrictions are going to be. So maybe he stops going to work because he stopped showering because his shoulder only has 90 degrees of function because there's a problem in the glenohumeral joint and that problem is with the musculoskeletal system of that joint. So he stops going to, can't have fun and do the wave, right? He can't go to the Raiders game and go, you stink, you stink. I don't know. I didn't even see the Raiders game this week. So I'm pretty sure the Patriots demolished them. So that he's not going, he's not going to his games anymore. Maybe he's a Vegas Golden Knights fan. And because he's got a shoulder problem, he didn't go to the last game of the Golden Knights, and that's why they lost. Right? Blame it on the bear. Oh no, they lost. All right. Oh, I had too much fun at this. What are some environmental factors that could possibly hinder his everyday function? So maybe he can't, his, this is stuck forever. So what are some environmental functions that are environmental things that will affect his everyday function? What if he drives a big old thing that I call a bro dozer? one of those F-250s, F-350s that are lifted, right? Is he going to have trouble driving one of those if his shoulder's at 90 degrees, stuck at 90? Yeah, he can't grab the handle to get in, right? So maybe his truck's an environmental factor that's keeping him from doing stuff. Um, maybe, what if, what if, you know, when he got the groceries before he injured his shoulder, he put all the soap on the top shelf of the cabinet? And that's why he can't shower. It's not that he doesn't want to shower, he doesn't have the ability to shower, but he can't reach up and grab the soap. That's an environmental factor. Um, now, let's say he can't drive because of this. We could get logically, wait, he's got the other arm. You'd be amazed how many people forget that. Right? Let's think of another environmental factor. Let's say I can't drive, and now I live in rural Idaho. Can I get around very easily? Around here, we take it for granted, don't we? I mean, we have we can get around the city pretty easily if we don't have, if we're not able to drive. I, I just can't, you know. I I, know, I take it kind of for granted that right, no Uber, no Lyft, right? I take it for granted that when I go out of town, I can leave my truck here and just take an Uber to the airport. Saves a little bit because trust me, those airport fees are ridiculous. Right? But in rural Idaho, they may not have that idea, right? Um, where I'm from in Pennsylvania, cabs, they'll come pick you up, but they'll also take half of your wallet. Right? For me to go to the airport from my home where I lived in Pennsylvania was $175 via cab. Right? So now those, that's another environmental factor, right? So those does that help under, make you understand what the ICF is looking at? The ICF is classifying him, but it's also looking at what's what the major problems are with him, right? So let's pause here. Let's take a little bit of a break. Get your brain kind of going here. Get some fresh coffee. I'm going to pause the recording for a second. Pause so for Zoom recording. Was it a boy or a girl? I don't know what happened with that gender reveal party thing. All right, so let's take a quick poll here. Launch in poll in three, two, one. So if a patient has a problem with their ability to balance a checkbook because of a TBI, what section of the ICF would this fall under? I better make sure that I've got the right answer chosen. That'd probably be a good idea.
Okay, so I got activity limitation at nine, got participation restriction. I like watching this live, this is fun. So I got 16, I got 25 e in here, come on. At least take a guess. I can't see who picked what, so. Eighteen of you. This is a test to see how many of you are awake. Nineteen of you. We'll give another thirty seconds here. This is reminiscent of what a board question might be for one of these. Now, obviously, they'll give you four choices, but I figured two is enough for right now. Ten seconds and the Jeopardy poll is closing. Do, 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 do. Yes, yeah, limit on my musical talent. All right, we're going to end polling here. So majority of people picked activity limitation and then about a third of the people have picked act participation limitation. So what do you guys think the answer is here? So obviously we've got a little bit of a split here. So an activity limitation, again, let's go back to sharing here. Screen share. We're gonna go back over here. Activity, activity limitation is gonna be the execution of specific tasks. So would you classify the checkbook balancing as a task to complete. Yeah, it is, right? Balancing the checkbook is an activity. Now, how would that change to our participation restriction? What could we say? What if we said, because he can't balance his checkbook, he can't learn in a classroom setting, good, because he can't pay his student loans. Then, yeah, now we're starting to get into more of that participation restrictions, not ability to do stuff, right? So that's the kind of stuff that's going to be similar to what your board questions look like for this, is they're going to be definitely looking at this going, I'm going to give you a specific thing. For example, they'll say that the patient has damage to the patellofemoral joint. Where would that fall on the ICF? The patellofemoral joint. Yeah, it'll fall under body structure. Exactly. Great. So that's kind of what you'll have to kind of divine out there when you're doing those questions on the board is looking at, well, where does this officially fall? All right. So let's bring my just wants back up here. All right, so back into the jazz of things. So the WHO kind of developed this ICF back in 1976 and it was to promote the consistent terminology. Um, there is the terms disease, impairment, disability, and handicap. Uh, I know nowadays handicap tends to be a bad word, right? We tend to use more handicapable, but Handicap is in those words, right? They revised it, looked at the um, activity limitation participation restrictions in the ICIH-2, and then we kind of finalized that ICF in 2001. Now, we do use the ICF in a lot of our billing and design, and Medicare even lays it out when they're doing a lot of their structures and some of the stuff we're going to talk about here. So the ICF is kind of the core of all of our examination of functional status. So both models, both the NAGI and the ICF look at loss as a function, right? But it's not truly a full loss all the time, right? When we have a musculoskeletal, we may lose range of motion. It doesn't mean we lose all range of motion. We talked about Teddy there with his loss of you know, 90 degrees shoulder flexion. 
when we have neuromuscular, we can lose strength, we can lose sensation, we can lose range of motion, and they do tend to overlap, <clears throat> right? If I lose strength, I may lose range of motion as well. If I lose range of motion, my strength may decline. And overall, the more and more stuff I do, the less I'll feel, so I'll lose sensation. Cardiovascular and pulmonary. It's a big problem right now, right? It's huge. Um, a lot of people are starting to lose some of their pulmonary endurance. Why? Because we've been indoors so much, right? We've been kind of cooped up. We may not be exercising as much as we used to. So our tolerance to activity is going to be down. Um, health problems are probably going to be up a little bit after this quarantine, just because we're not doing as much. In tegumentary, we can have wounds, wound healing, scar tissue can all kinds of problems, right? We can have neuromuscular, there are all kinds of other stuff that can be lost, right? If you lose your mind, does that literally mean, and yeah, there's wildfires everywhere, right? If you lose your mind, does that literally mean if we open up your skull, there's no brain there anymore? I mean, we may think about that with some people, right? But if you lose mental faculties, it doesn't mean that those structures are gone. It just means they're not functioning anymore, right? Think about that, like totally. It's like totally there. So let's think of somebody that has a frontal lobe injury, right? So they smash the front of their head. There's a couple of things that could happen there because they can lose some range of motion. They can lose some executive function, right? But they may not be totally impaired, right? They probably can still walk around, get around places and stuff like that. They're just going to make a lot of bad decisions. That's why we need to look at this as a kind of scale, not necessarily a spectrum of loss, not necessarily a full it's there or it isn't there. Uh, even something like looking at a spinal cord injury, when we talk about loss of bowel and bladder, Sometimes even that can be on a spectrum. They may not have bladder, but they have bowel, or maybe they have bowel, but don't have bladder, or maybe they have partial bladder that it'll fill up that's a you know, reflexive bladder that it'll only empty when it's full. So there are a couple of different ways that this could be a true spectrum of loss. Autism is another great example of kind of looking at this. We used to just classify as somebody as autistic and put everyone in the same bucket. But what have we found out now about autism? We, do we classify somebody as autistic anymore or what do we put them under? Right, we call it the spectrum, right? The ASD, they have autism spectrum disorder. Because if you've ever worked with anyone that has autism, there is a whole range of function from down to no function to very, very high level functioning people. I'd be willing to bet if I grew up nowadays, like I was when I was a kid, that I'd probably be fall somewhere on that spectrum. I'd probably be classified somewhere along there. When I look back at the way I kind of acted as a kid, I probably would have been fall, they probably would have handled me a little different. I probably would have fallen somewhere on the spectrum. Does that mean as an adult, I'm off the spectrum? No, right? When they grow up, they still have that spectrum disorder, right? But again, it's not letting that disease define you. So let's look at some functional tests. Why do we, why, why, what do you think are some of the reasons we have to perform functional testing on patients? So why might we have to do something like the timed up and go or the sit the sand test? Why might we have to do that? Anyone have any ideas or thoughts? Bueller, Bueller. Well, what, yeah, so we have a baseline. Good, right? Baseline's important. But what about insurances? Do they require these? Yeah, right? They wanna see that you're actually doing something with the patient. That's one of the reasons we do it, right? Because we gotta justify our billing. We've gotta justify them coming to therapy. So examination of function tests, who's gonna perform them? Whose responsibility do you think it is in the rehab world? PT is gonna usually do the first one, right? Does that mean we don't do them? 
Yeah, we still do them. Absolutely, all right, right? We still do them. We're not gonna do the initial baseline. Well, we may. Let's, let, let, let's clarify that. Let's say that we're testing a patient's timed up and go. We may do the first timed up and go. All we're gonna do is do the test and report the findings. The PT is gonna interpret it, right? So depending upon the test, there are lots of thoughts and perspectives on the test. Some of the tests are really, you know, pretty quick, easy to administer, but man, some of those tests are pain. We're gonna talk about PDMS in a little bit and that's a, whew, that is a bear, right? So the problem with these tests though, and when you think about them, it's very much like an ECG. What is an ECG? Well, it's an ECG. What does an ECG tell us? Erica should be able to tell us that. It's an electrocardiogram. It looks at the heart electrical activity, right? Does that tell us that the patient has dead heart muscle? Better yet, can it tell us? It may tell us, it may not, right? More importantly, it can indicate what's going on that very second that it's being administered, right? Same thing with our tests. Our tests give us a snapshot of what the patient looks like this minute, right? So if you did a timed up and go on me right now, my performance would be based upon how I do in the morning, how much caffeine I've had, how my day's going, everything that affects. But if you do it later in the afternoon, could those results be different? Yeah, right? So that we, again, we've got to look at the spectrum of function as well. So we're gonna look at how a patient performs or fill certain roles. It provides us the baseline information for setting goals, right? And then also kind of our outcomes of, the, of therapy. We need to look at where they are so we can know where to get them. And again, it shows the ability to progress towards more complex functional levels. When we're doing stuff, we always want to start at the basics first and work our way forward. Right? I think about it a lot when, um, when I was taught how to do tasks, right? And Erica can relate to this. When I learned martial arts forms, I didn't learn the most advanced martial art form when I was a white belt. It would have made no sense to me. And looking at the high level forms, man, some of them are really complex in their movements, right? But first, exactly right. I learned how to stand. I learned how to do different stances. I learned how to fall. All of that came into play before I got to the more advanced stuff. It'll identify criteria for placement decisions. We're going to talk about placement decisions towards the end of this. The need for inpatient rehab, extended care, and everything like that. It also lets us know what their safety levels are. This is a big one, right? Because if they have a really, really poor safety level, there's a real good chance that they're gonna have further complications. And it'll also tell us how good those surgeries are, right? Carpal tunnel is an excellent example of it. I'm, you know, I, I know I like to kind of bash on this a little bit, but when you have a CTS release, carpal tunnel syndrome release, most of the patients, and I'm gonna, I'm going to throw a number out there and say 80%. It's got to be close to that that I've seen. Most of the patients that have CTS release end up coming out worse than they went in. So they go in thinking that that carpal tunnel surgery is going to fix all their nerve problems and they come out and they're in more pain and have more loss of function. And there are studies out there that show that certain Right, it is, right? It's a huge bummer. You just went through a massive surgery, well, not massive, but big surgery. And now you come out worse than you did and you're hoping that you came out better. Why is a surgeon gonna recommend surgery? Money, right? It's, it's their job, right? If you go to a Chevy dealer, that's not likely that a Chevy dealer is gonna say, hey, why don't you come over here and look at this Ford F-150? Right? They're going to try to sell you a Chevy. Right? You go to a Kia dealer. 
they're not going to try to sell you a Porsche. Well, I mean, if they have one lot, maybe, like a used one, right? But they're not going to try to sell you a Porsche. They're going to try to sell you a Sedona or a Telluride or whatever. I don't even know what the Kia models are anymore, right? You go to a, you go to a Celtos. There we go, right? You go into a Ford dealership and say, hey, I want to look at those new Corvettes. You went to the wrong place, right? They're not going to sell you a Corvette. They'll say, hey, I've got a Mustang over here. And you'll say, nah, it's OK, right? That's kind of a, kind of a thing when you go through this is that it, they, the person's going to recommend what they do, right? If you come to us with carpal tunnel surgery or carpal tunnel problems, what do you think we're going to recommend? We're going to recommend therapy. Yeah, right? Maybe even OT. Do you think PTs ever recommend surgery? If we, yeah, if it's needed, right? But I, I, it's one thing I will say about it that I've encountered in the PT world is we're fairly an equal opportunity person, right? If the person needs surgery, we're going to tell them they need surgery person needs OT for fine motor skills, we're going to send them to OT. It's not like we're going to keep them in our wheelhouse and say, you're mine, my precious patient, my birthday present. No, we're going to say, hey, you can't grab things with your fingers. You need to go see OT. Okay, I'm going to go see OT. I'm, the bear's going to give you guys nightmares. Right, exactly. Erica made a great point. She goes, so I've heard in the clinic that when a patient knows they need surgery, it's all that gets stuck in their head, right? Did any of you encounter somebody that came to you and said, I'm just here because my insurance says I have to do PT before surgery? Great. Why does the insurance say that? Is it because they want to they wanna pay for it? Yeah. Right? You send somebody over for surgery for low back pain and they have PT for eight weeks and all of a sudden the back pain goes away. That Medicare provider now looks pretty smart because they just saved a ton of surgery money. Right? It's just, that's kind of the way we are. You want to exhaust all options before opening a person up because we know in this country, 33% of the people that go in for surgery are going to get a what? Infection, right? Think about that. Makes you think about going and get surgery, doesn't it? I was one of those 33%. My whole open neck, when I had my neck surgery, opened up, dehissed, had pus rolling out of it. It was great. It was beautiful. And I took care of my wound. I hope I did at least. I vaguely remember that. So PTs are typically the first responsible person for doing these tests. And we'll look at functional motor skills like bed mobility, transfers, locomotion. Remember, locomotion can include wheelchair mobility, ambulation, stairs, all of that as well. ADLs and IADLs they may be completed by the PT or may be completed by other healthcare professionals, maybe OT, maybe respiratory, maybe nursing, right? But when we're in that re true rehabilitation setting, we work as a team. PT works with OT, that works with RT, that works with SLP, that works with nursing to try to get these tests done because a lot of times these tests are required in order for the patient to ever leave the hospital. So the PT needs to determine whether data collected needs, needs to describe their habitual level of the patient function or identify the patient's capacity. So are we looking at how they do normally? Are we looking at how much better we can get them? And that's depending on how we're looking at there, right? This is why the PT's job is a little bit more in depth than, right? They've got a lot of paperwork to go through for this. We have to understand what the difference between a person does and what they're willing to do. So if I tell you guys right now, I need you to go run a 5K, you have to do that right after class. That's part of your homework. Some of you will say, okay, we can do that, right? 
Now, you'd be really sad, right? But could you do it? You probably could complete it. The question is, would you be willing to complete it? I'm not going to put that. That's not a homework, by the way. Right. And the will has a lot to do with it. And then we have to look at what's designing their realistic functional goals, right? We have a patient that for the past five years has never walked more than 75 feet. And we set a goal that's 250 feet. Do you think they're likely to achieve it? Probably not, right? And because in their head, they're saying, I only have to walk 75 feet in my trailer and that gets me to the front to the back. That's all I need. So we have to involve patients in it, right? So we have to abide by the patient's own decisions on which tasks and activities will be incorporated into their daily routine. And what's a meaningful level of function? Sometimes that meaningful level of function isn't what we'd consider functioning, right? What if I have a PT that's a marathon runner and he thinks that running 26 miles is a meaningful level of function, right? If he thinks that, that's fantastic. I'm gonna say, ain't no way. Right there, you're right, nope, yeah, maybe, right? I'm be like, I can drive 26 miles. I'm okay with that, but I ain't gonna run no 26 miles. So we have to take those patients into consideration. We have to look, when we're doing this testing, we have to have a conducive area to test, free of distractions. We have to make sure our instructions are given in precise and unambiguous manners. Maybe even in the language the person speaks, that would be a good thing. Consider a time of day when a patient might be more fatigued, right? We have a Parkinson's patient. We're gonna learn when we get to Parkinson's, they operate better in the morning and are worse in the evenings. A uh, person that's got sundowner syndrome, man, you better get all your therapy in before five o'clock. They become a whole different person after five. They, uh, vampires, I think, will be more functional after five. For me, I function a ton better the later in the day it goes. Even though I'm up really early, from about four to six, I'm really functional. And then from about six to about four in the afternoon, I'm kind of eh. And then four to about seven, I'm nappy period time. And then I my function level picks up again. It's We're all a little different the way we function. Retesting should occur at regular intervals, but also test different time periods sometimes to see what they're like at different periods. And if we do a test at evaluation and during treatment, that same test needs to be repeated at discharge. We have to have a baseline, a performance, and a finish line. And most insurances won't approve your PT unless you've done that. So what are we looking at? We're looking at their habitual function. How do they do things routinely, right? If I ask all of you guys right now, I'm pretty confident all of you have a routine that you go through in the morning. It probably involves pressing the snooze button a few times. For me, it may involve three to five pots of coffee, right? We all have a routine we go through. What is your habit of functioning? If I gave you my routine that I do every morning, it may not work for you, right? If I tell Jaira that from now on, he's getting up at four o'clock and at four o'clock in the morning, he's gonna go running for two miles you may not be happy with me, right? But then if I do his morning routine, it may not be conducive to me either, right? I don't know, rolling out of bed right before class, that may not be that conducive. Just kidding, Tara. Capacity of function, how could they perform? What is their ability to get better? And then think about it. Has your performance ever exceeded your habitual performance? Have you ever done better than you normally do? Right? I know you guys, some of you guys I've seen on your tests, right? You're like, man, I'm gonna fail this test. Oh God. And then you do your test and you get your test back, and you're like, holy crap, I didn't do so bad. Right? We're always able to do a little bit better. My instructor in the martial arts, again, martial arts shaped a lot of my life. My instructor in the martial arts always showed me how I could do more than I thought I could do. Right? 
I'm doing a split. He'd come by and kick our legs out and show, hey, look, you can go down a little bit further. Right? You can take a little bit more pain. You can do a few more reps. All of that comes into play. We become the instructors of patients, showing them that they can do more than they think they can do. In a way, we're not much different than a cheerleader, are we? Right, exactly. It's okay to be uncomfortable, right? My, uh, my instructor's famous phrase that sticks to me this day is pain is your body's way of thanking you for using it. I always thought that was kind of funny. Right? Now that is also talking about good pain. That's not necessarily talking about, oh my God, I broke my arm. Your body's not thanking you at that point. Right? But you know, you've done this, you've gone to the gym, you've worked out, all of you have at some point. And man, at the end of that gym, you're just like, oh my God, what, uh, why did I do that? Or you do leg day and then you go sit on the toilet. Right? Or maybe you're going through the airport and you have to sit on the toilet at the airport and the airport's one of those, you know, the only one that's open is the handicap stall and it's all the way on the floor or something like that, or a kid's stall. And then all of a sudden you're like, uh, well, I need a cane to get up from this. Right now you understand why they've got those pull bars on the sides. So performance-based tests are administered by a therapist or another skilled person who observes the patient during the performance of the activity. Let's go through it and look at a couple of these here. How many of you guys have seen one of these in the test, right? The six minute walk test, physical performance and mobility examination, functional reach test, get up and go, timed up and go, the PBR or PPB, physical performance battery, right? All these are really simple tests to perform, right? And the easier the test, the quicker and more efficient it is at performing the test, right? Six minute walk test is probably one of the easiest tests you can do. I can teach you how to do it in three seconds. What do you think you have to do? Walk for six minutes, amazing. And then you're measuring their distance to go. And then vitals as well and stuff like that. It often doesn't measure the task or activity as might be accomplished in the real world, right? If I'm going to do a six minute walk test, how do you think I'm going to have a patient perform that in a clinic? What do you think they're going to be on? Treadmill, exactly, Dylan. Is that like the same as walking around them all? No, right? So we're looking at a function in a kind of closed environment. Could I do that though? Maybe I'm, I've tested to see how patient functions and said we go to the mall and do the six minute walk test. Could that tell me something different about the patient? Sure could, right? I love doing little field trips like that with patients because they may be more motivated to walk around the mall because over there Stella and Jim's got his eye on Stella. So he's gonna show off and do his little mall walking strut, right? You're usually quick to administer performance-based. We have self-reports. This is a patient's level of function gathered by a direct interview of the therapist or a trained interview or a self-administered report. This captures correct, if it captured correctly, you can completely lies in providing clearly worded questions without bias, concise directions on completing questions in a format that encourages accurate reporting. Um, need to have a frame of reference when we're doing this. There needs to be in the past 24 hours and last week, last month, so when you're doing self-reports, this is going to be stuff like, um, in the past 24 hours, I have experienced pain. Yes, no. In the past 24 hours, what is the greatest level of pain I've experienced, right? My favorite of those is the one that you have, Mr. McKeever's drawing here, you know, that you have the picture of the person and it says, please indicate where on the body your pain is with X's or dashes. And this is the report you get back from the patient. Right? And you're like, great, what do I do with that? That doesn't tell me anything. Sometimes we fill out reports like we think they're supposed to be filled out and less like they actually are. Right? Have, think about that to yourself. Have you ever been, have you ever filled out a report 
or anything like that based upon what you're, you think people are hoping to see versus what's reality? Have you ever done that? Yeah, I know I have. Right? I'm looking at this going, man, I don't want to admit to that. I don't want to admit I had concussions. If I admit I have concussions, I'm probably going to get ruled out here. Instrument parameters, whether it's self-report, whether it's a performance base, it should be well-defined and unambiguous. Here's the neat thing, guys. You all can divine, divine, design a, a test of functional status, right? We could be looking in five years at the Newsom Butts level of leg functioning test. Right, that that would be a great one. The uh, the butts level of gluteal function test. How's that sound? Right, you could design it. There's nothing that says you can't. All these tests have been developed by people, and the tests are constantly improved on. When we're doing parameters, the term independent refers to the complete absence of need for human or mechanical assistance. Now, sometimes they will call a modified form of independence when they maybe have a device but don't need a person. But understand that. Difficulty is a hybrid term, right? Every person has a different difficulty level. If we all went out and again, do some butts. We go out today and we all get in a line and we all walk five miles. Are we all going to finish at the same time? No, we're not, right? It's going to be more difficult for other people. I guarantee that we probably all could finish it if we wanted to, if we push through it. I'm sure that doing it at noon in Las Vegas would not be the most fun thing in the world. So we want to quantify these degrees of difficulty. How much difficulty do you have when going up the stairs? None, some, a great deal. Or quantify the frequency of difficulty. How often do you have difficulty putting on your shoes? Never, sometimes, often, very often, or always. We're quantifying those levels of difficulty, right? Quantification is really important. Just ask them, do you have problems going up downstairs? Yes, no. It reminds me of those things we used to have in elementary school. Those little paper, I forgot what those things were called. Like, does he like me? Yes, right? It's the magic eight ball theory. Magic eight ball doesn't tell us anything, right? Until you get the signs are ambiguous. That's pretty much what you're doing within a magic eight ball. So we need to quantify them a little bit. Um, we may quantify them with pain, fluctuations, according to time of day, medication level, environmental factors energy consumption, all this can affect the way they perform for you. If you have a patient that's on barbiturates, man, their function may be way off. So we talked about these terms before, right? Independent, supervision, close guarding, contact guarding. Um, most, most paperwork called close guarding and contact guarding the same thing, but some of them don't. So this is where you have to know your test to know what you're talking about. I'm not gonna go through these again. You've gone through these in rehab one, so I'm not gonna read through them again. Balance grades. These are another one. Normal, patients able to maintain steady balance without support, accepts maximal dynamic challenges and shifts weight easily within full ranges. Some of us, even now, if I tested you guys, you may not have normal balance. That's okay, right? Friday nights, your normal balance may be way off. Good, a patient's able to maintain balance without any support, limited postural sway, static. So if you look at this, if a patient needs one hand support, they can never be a good balance grade, right? They're at best gonna be a fair. So we need to be paying attention to that. Fair, patient's able to maintain balance with handheld support. It requires some minimal assistance. And of course, poor, we required handheld support and mod, mod assistance. And then no balance. What does a person look like that's got no balance? What do you think they'd look like? They're gonna be all over the place. You know, baby deer, that's a great, there's a baby deer and a hot mess, a hot and debt mess baby deer. I like those choices. 
So some parameters, it takes time to complete a serious functional test, right? So that means we need to make sure the patient understands that, especially when they're coming in for an eval. If you ever are working in that front desk and helping out the front desk people, please make sure that if you're scheduling a person for an eval, they need to understand they need to be here for the full eval and probably 15 to 20 minutes early because they got a lot of functional tests they're going to have to do. And what I, what well, PTs hate the most is a patient that comes in for a new eval two minutes late to their eval and then comes back and they're getting their eval and they're like, I've got to go in 20 minutes. right? That doesn't lead to good measurements. Um, maybe time, walking a set distance, writing one's name, all this stuff can happen. We can score tests. It may not always be better to correct, or maybe not always, it may not always be correct. There we go. I can speak today. To conclude what's measured as quicker and as interpreted as better. Doing things fast is not always best, right? Slow and steady wins the race here. That's why you need to tell a patient, right? You tell the patient the first time to do the timed up and go, their thought process is they have to do it as fast as possible. And I've had it where the patient gets up and they're <laughs> struggling down that timed up and go. They get down to that turnaround point, <laughs> down they go. Because they think that they need to do it fast. What I'm really looking for is how fast do they do it safely. Measures. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all of these. You do need to know the difference between a nominal measure and an ordinal measure. So read through this because this is a stuff that's gonna come into play and it's gonna be important when you're looking at testing, right? What's the difference between a nominal? What's the difference between an ordinal? So this is a page to study as this is gonna come back to bite you in, in the uh, your boards. So we're gonna talk about a couple specific assessments We'll start with the FIM, get through the Wii FIM, and then probably take a break. So the FIM, how many of you guys saw a FIM while you were out there in the real world? Did anyone see a FIM? A FIM performed? Did anyone hear about a FIM? Nope, okay, so I got no. What's surprising, we must have had a lot of people going down uh, inpatient at that or inpatient hospital at that point. The FIM is an 18 point measure of physical, psychological, and social functions. That means there are 18 things we have to complete. It's part of the UDS for medical rehab for the Medicare. So it collects this data to help us determine what needs to be done with the patient. Most rehab facilities require a FIM prior to coming in because if they don't have that FIM, they can't get authorization for the patient for rehab. So they're gonna require the hospital to do a FIM and then they're gonna do another FIM when the patient comes in comparing that. Um, it also, Medicare requires the FIM scoring to determine if funds will be appropriated, right? How much, if you're in a nursing home, the FIM will help determine how much time and therapy you'll get at that nursing home. If you have a poor level FIM, you might get less time. Oh, there we go. Irene saw one. It uses a level of assistance that we talked about, mod assist, max assist, all this. It measures what the individual does, not what they could do under certain circumstances. So it's only a snapshot. That FIM is gonna tell you how they did today at nine o'clock. It's not gonna tell you about their prior level of function. It's not gonna tell you about their future level of function. Just that, that nine o'clock test. The inter-rater reliability is acceptable as well as face and content validity. That's a big phrase there, but let's break that down. What does inter-rater reliability mean? First of all, what's inter-rater mean? It means that if we have Derek Carr and one of his wide receivers, we have the inter-raters, right? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. no. Wow, okay, Michelle got it, thanks, appreciate it. What does inter-rater mean? Inter meaning what? Going back to midterm. If you're on the interstate, you are on a road that goes between states, right? So inter-rater means between multiple people. 
And if a test is reliable, that means we can count on it. So what this inner rate of reliability says is when multiple people do this test, because of the way it's designed, we can count on the results. That's what inner rate of reliability means. And then face and content validity is a little different. That says that not only is it measuring what it's supposed to measure at face validity, but it's also very valid for what we need, content validity. So it's gonna measure a patient's level of function, which is face validity. And it all, each section of that is responsible for what it needs to be. So each section that measures bed mobility, that measures you know, transfers, it measures walking. It's very valid. So it's a really high correlative test. It's really good for a patient. It's also really short, it's 18 items to do. Now, does that mean all those 18 items are fun to do? No, because one of them is self-care. That's not always a fun thing to do. It does have a very extensive manual. Um, yeah, hold on. I thought I had one. So there's the FIM manual. It is 432 pages. On how to do a FIM for 18 items. And Michelle will tell you that is very common for anything that's involving the government. Would you agree with that, Michelle? Yeah, right, it is. It's military, you need to change a lug nut. There's probably a manual that's about 40 pages long. Right, it is an extensive manual. You do have to learn it. And it also requires you a, to do a certification test to complete it for patient files. So here's the thing with that. If you're gonna work in an inpatient setting and you're seeing patients that are discharged to rehab, guess what? Everyone has to be certified on the FIM. And I think it's a 25 question certification test. If your facility does it legit, it's a closed book test. But I know that certain facilities just don't do that, which is kind of bad because you're never gonna know what you don't know unless you do it legitimately. Uh, there is a thing called the WeFIM. The WeFIM is developed to use with children between the ages of six months and 18 years. So when you're looking at the FIM, the one thing I want you to remember is the FIM is an inpatient acute care um, functional status measurement. So that means it's gonna be used primarily where? What setting? When I say inpatient acute care, what should be the first thing that comes to mind? Hospitals, yeah, right? Exactly. So the hospitals are where you're going to see these. And the hospitals do have kids, so you will see WeFIM in there, there for the six months to 18 year range. All right, I'm going to take a pause here and we'll talk about the PAI. So let's pause recording. All right, so we're going to resume recording here. So the last thing we talked about was the FIM. So now we're going to talk about the IRF PAI. This is a fairly new subject. The in, inpatient rehab facility patient account inventory. Really what this is, is an expansion of the FIM to help determine final discharge locations from an inpatient rehab facility. Inpatient rehab facilities are still considered inpatient worlds, obviously, because they're not going home. The difference between an inpatient and an outpatient world is inpatients, you never go home. Outpatient, you spend some time at home. So the PAI is an assessment instrument inpatient rehab facility providers use to collect patient assessment data for quality measures, calculation, and payment determination. So this is all set up by Medicare. And what you guys will find out, we're going to do a whole class on insurance next semester. And I'm sure that you guys are just raring to go to learn about insurance because insurance is fun. That's, yes, that is what they tell me to talk about in the PT world, insurance is fun. Um, but Medicare kind of drives our whole aspect. Medicare tells us what we can and can't do. 
Um, but the APAI looks at things like pre-hospital, living situation, comorbid conditions, communication status, and functional status. So it's a little bit more in depth with the FIM. Uh, still has an extensive manual. This manual is like another 400 pages and again requires certification to administer. So FIM, inpatient acute, rehab, IRF, PAI. The next thing we're going to talk about is the Oasis and the Wonder Wall. No? No, oh, fine. I thought that was an amusing joke. The Oasis is pretty much the bane of my existence in home health care because Oasis is the home health care version of the FIM and the IRFPAI. Collects pertinent data on adult population in the home care setting. So again, FIM, inpatient acute, IRF, PAI, PAI, rehab, OASIS, outpatient. Uh, it was revised in 2016 to the OASIS C2. You'll find a lot of times when they revise it, they just put a letter and a number after it. That's pretty much what Medicare does. It includes numbers being renumbered and assigned to a range of numbers for medication management outside of the ADLs, IADLs. Um, the ADL, IADL section has been increased to 14 items, including grooming, dressing, dressing the lower body, bathing, toileting, transfer, ambulation, feeding, meal prep, transportation, laundry, housekeeping, shopping, and the ability to use telephone. So if I'm doing an oasis on a patient, I have to observe them doing all of those. So we may have to go to the store and see how they do shopping. Shopping on Amazon does not count. Right? We all have the ability to shop on Amazon. I have to see if they're able to keep their house clean. I have to see if they're able to use the telephone. Um, Siri does not count. They have to physically grab their phone and they have to be able to dial a number. They also have to be able to recall a number. It's meant to be integrated in a clinical record to highlight a various aspect of the patient's status. It should be done at follow-up every 60 days and at discharge. My personal opinion, a home health patient should not be on home health for 60 days. Home health just can't do that much for a patient. It's just not, it's not viable. They should be at outpatient very soon. Like I prefer to get them at outpatient within two weeks. We're gonna talk about that, we talk about discharge. The SF36, and if you've ever worked, if you've ever been in a um, VA hospital, you've probably seen this. SF36 is another government term here, short form 36. Guess how many items are in the SF36? Can you guess? 36, I know, it's amazing, right? Originally there were 113, it was originally the SF113. Thank God, right? They, they streamlined it down. So the SF-36 is primarily used in the military setting and for research. It's a very, very, very valid scientific tool. It is almost too long to use in the inpatient setting, which is why we only use the FIM-18, right? It's half of what the SF-36 is. But the SF-36 takes into like physical function, social function, mental function, energy fatigue and pain. So it's a little bit better. And it also includes a 36 item, which is perceived change in health, right? They're usually scaled on nominal yes, no, or ordinal scales. So it'll ask you, which the FIM doesn't, I feel that my health has improved in the past year, slightly, moderately, greatly. So it gives you the ability to compare where you are right now to your previous level of function, which the FIM does not. It's been used in almost, the SF-36 is used in almost every study. If you look at most studies that are done in physical therapy, they are using the SF-36 for their level, when they're measuring function. Uh, it stands as the premier example of complete and published exploration of the psychometric. When you see psychometric, it means numbers, properties of an instrument, and it's essential in the part of development. It's really heavily used, again, in research, and it's really heavily used in the military. The people that help write your tests for your boards are psychometricians. They are basically psychologists that specialize in numbers. That to me sounds like the most awesome not job in the world. 
right? They literally know the psychology of numbers. That's what psychometric properties involve is looking at those psychology of those numbers. So again, I'm gonna hit it again. FIM or the FIM 18, inpatient, acute care, i.e. hospitals, IRFPAI, inpatient rehab facilities, and we'll also talk about outpatient as well. They use the IRFPAI as well. But rehab facilities, OASIS, home health setting. Short form 36, military and research. And then we have the PMOS or the PDMS, the Peabody Developmental Motor Scale. The PMOS is a pediatric functional scale. It helps provide the pediatric provider with a clear rating of the child's gross motor, fine motor, and total motor quotient. It, in the parent's world, it helps them put the pay, their child on a scale of where they rate with other children. And you would think that this wouldn't matter to parents, but oh my God, they really want to know where their child is, the Peabody Developmental Motor Scale. PDMS. I should have typed that. That's actually pretty important. So Peabody Developmental Motor Scale. Most of the times you're just going to see it as PDMS because nobody wants to type that out. Is that what you're talking about, Erica? Oh, the FIM stuff. Okay. FIM, inpatient acute care, i.e. hospital. In IRFPAI, inpatient rehab facility, patient account inventory, rehab facilities, OASIS, home health setting, SF36, military and research. And then we have the Peabody, the PDMS, which is specific to the outpatient pediatric world. So again, with the pediatric, the PDMS, they're going to rate that child and give them a quotient percentile. And they'll say that your child is within the top 99 percentile or the top one percentile. And man, this makes parents just super competitive. And it's always the kids that you don't want to be competitive with that makes the parents be competitive. It's really sad because if you're doing the Peabody, it usually means that child is developmentally delayed. And it's not good to compare a developmentally delayed person against a normal person, but they do it. Uh, it does contain normative data, meaning they test it against normal kids nowadays, and they do adjust it. This was the second version of it, PDMS-2. So they have adjusted it based upon newer values. I think the last time it was adjusted was 2010. So it looks at motor development, right? This looks almost exactly like you guys learned in growth and development, some of the stuff that we're going to measure. It measures reflexes, right? So we're gonna see how they do reacting to the environment. It tests our stationary ability, the ability to sustain control of the body with a controlled environment. I have a problem with this. I'm constantly moving. I don't like being stationary, right? And kids don't like it either. This can be really difficult to tell a kid, I need you to stand still for 30 seconds with your feet together. What do you think a kid does when you tell them that? It's really difficult to work with kids. Um, it's just funny though. It's like you're trying to measure their stationary ability and you're like, oh God, stop. No candy, stop. Locomotion, it measures the ability for the child to move from one place to another. Um, we will measure it in different stages, crawling, walking, running, hopping, and jumping forward. We'll measure hopping and jumping based upon one foot or two foot. Object manipulation, the ability to manipulate balls, including large balls, small balls, catching, kicking, throwing, one-handed kicking, or one, yeah, one-handed kicking. Great job, Mr. McKeever. One-handed catching, one-handed kicking, or one-footed kicking, I said it again. Grasping, the ability for children to use their hands. Are they able to grab, thanks, Jair, I appreciate it. Are they able to grab a pen? Are they able to grab a pencil, right? 
Has anyone ever seen a kid pick up a crayon for the first time? How do they grab it? Yeah, like this, right? That's why those kids crayons are what? Yeah, big, because they don't have that fine motor skill to put in this position for drawing. They haven't developed the three jaw chuck yet that we all, and some people never get out of that. Did you ever see somebody that writes like this? Where they don't put it between the fingers and stuff like that, right? They were never trained to write. I, I don't know how somebody writes like that. I can't control the pen. And then also talking about visual motor integration, the ability of a child to use their visual perception to explore complex eye-hand coordination tasks, such as reaching, grasping for an object. A lot of times we're going to use cones for this. So again, this is looking at, there's a lot of stuff here. The Peabody itself, the book is 36 pages of tests. And as you're testing the child, if you're testing locomotion and you, the only thing the child can do is crawl, you're going to test the next stage. But if they can't do it, you're only going to grade them on crawling. You're not going to grade them on walking because that wouldn't be fair to the child. You can't grade them on walking if they can't do it. Right? You can't grade a kid on catching a ball excuse me, if they're six months old. Children that young usually don't catch balls very well, except with their face. And some adults catch balls really well with their face too, right? I always think that, you know, when I watch boxing or when I watch the, you know, mixed martial arts or stuff like that, I think those people block those punches and those kicks really well with their head. The PDMS is again for child. So going back again, because I'm going to keep, keep hitting this. The FIM or the FIM 18. Inpatient acute care, i.e. hospitals, IRF, PAI, rehab facilities, OASIS, home health, SF36, research and military, and then the PDMS, outpatient child. So the main thing here is no measurement, none of these measures all potentially relevant items. Out of all these we talked about, none of them address mobility and dexterity. So we're not talking about, so when I say mobility, right, or better yet, the term would be agility would be the better term, right? Because you're going to see this frequently. When we talk about agility, what are we talking about? What body parts? If you're doing agility drills, what are you moving? You're moving your lower extremities. Good. Versus dexterity, you're using your, yeah, your upper extremities, right? So agility, lower extremities, dexterity, upper extremities. The FIM and the OASIS do, or do contain more basic activities of daily living than the SF36, but the SF36 investigates work performance where the FIM and OASIS don't. Anxiety and depression are addressed under the SF36 and the OASIS, but not in FIM. Uh, the OASIS doesn't explore social function while the other two instruments do. Only the SF36 records general health perceptions. The SF36 was designed for younger adult population, i.e. under 65, that are able to walk. The FIM was developed in inpatient facilities. And the OASIS was developed specifically for home health agencies, mainly for older patients. So they may not apply as well to somebody that's like Hector's age. So this basically says that none of these devices are 100% written in stone in the best way to do things. So it's no per nothing's perfect for all the situations. Now, you work at an outpatient clinic that specializes in hands. You may be able to develop your own one of these that is just peachy keen. Until you've done it with a bunch of patients and have valid data, you can't really be sure that that is a functional test that you is good for measuring, right? Many items overlap from in instrument to instrument. When you do the FIM, a lot of it's going to carry over when they do the PAI. Um, they may address the same type of activity but pose questions differently. Like one may ask, can you dress yourself? And then the other may ask, how much help do you need to dress yourself? 
So when we're looking and selecting an instrument, some of the things we have to ask, what are the domains or categories that the instrument focuses on, right? How does it measure the domain or domains being sampled? What are the skills and functions included? What aspect of function is being measured? Is it on the dependence independence level? Is it on a scale of zero to five? Is it a degree of difficulty? What about the influence of pain? How long do you have to implement this instrument? If you only have a 20 minute eval, you've got to have something that's quick, down and dirty. What's the mode of administration? Can it be easily duplicated by an untrained person? Right? What type of scoring systems use? Are multiple instruments needed? Right? Maybe you work at the outpatient, uh, outpatient orthopedic and they need to do both the Oswestry and the DASH in the lower extension and functional scale. Okay, great. Get as many data points as you can because the more data points you have, the better you have at validating PT. What does your facility require? And a lot of facilities use the shotgun approach. So they'll just say, we require it all. And so the PT then ends up spending, you know, their night sitting at home recording patients' data. And then what does the insurance require? Some insurances require certain things. Medicare is very specific on the tests it requires. All right, that's it for the lecture. Let me stop sharing here. So let me bring up my other screen. So we're going to talk about discharge now. Let me grab my tablet here. Because Mr. McKeever is going to draw now. I know you're all excited. Oh, come on, pencil. There we go. I've got a new toy I'm playing with, so we'll see how this works. I've learned some new tricks. So I'm going to share screen, share an iPad. All right. It's slowly connecting here. Come on. You can do it. There we go. All right, so y'all can see my nice little whiteboard, I assume at this point. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a patient being discharged. So let's come up with a scenario. Your patient comes in, they have a left, why is it not writing? A left hip fracture. So your patient comes into the hospital, they've got a left hip fracture. They go down for surgery, they do an ORIF, so they internally fixate that hip. Your patient is gonna start out in that acute care setting. So acute care, i.e. hospital, right? That's where they're gonna start out at. Now, as soon as you start seeing your patient, you have to start thinking about where they're going to go. That should be in your mind as even as a PTA, because you're going to be asked your opinion on this. So as soon as you start seeing your patient, you have to start thinking about where do I want to send them? What are they safe to do? What is the most ideal place to send a patient after they leave the hospital? Yeah, home. Right? So home's the ideal. That's best. Because that means they've gotten better or good to send them home. They're safe to go home. Well, maybe they're not quite safe enough to go home. 
So your next best option, if they're not quite safe enough to go home, they need some more therapy. And we're not gonna talk, we're gonna talk about where we can send them at home as well. But now we're just talking about what's the next kind of level down. The next kind of level down is an IRF an inpatient rehab facility, okay? Do you guys remember what the requirements are to send somebody to inpatient rehab? There are very specific requirements. Then you remember any of them? They have to be in an acute care setting, good. They don't necessarily have to be older. I've seen, I've seen kids as young as y'all go to rehab. So first of all, they have to be coming from a hospital, which we already got that established, right? They have to be able to tolerate, oops. Three hours of therapy. They have to need assistance, you're right. They have to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy a day. They also have to need at least two disciplines. So what would be an example of a discipline? OT, great, PT, RT, respiratory therapy, SLP, speech language pathology. So they need to be able to, they need at least two disciplines so they can't just require PT. But I guarantee if a person requires PT, they need OT. So we can always pretty much justify that. If they can't walk, they need some fine motor training as well and some home stuff, ADL stuff. They can require all distance. They can require PT, OT, speech, respiratory. If they need that, great. And also include psychological in there, but it's not typically in the inpatient rehab facility. The more disciplines that's required, the less time that patient has to spend in each discipline, right? But usually you need two. So usually they're gonna to come to see PT and OT. That means PT is gonna get an hour and a half of therapy a day. OT is gonna get an hour and a half of therapy a day. Usually it's gonna be broken up into 45 minute chunks in the morning and the afternoon, usually. So the patient has to be able to tolerate that. They cannot refuse therapy. Now, if they choose not to have therapy now, <clears throat> they will have to make those time that time up because their insurance carrier will eventually deny them. And if their insurance carrier denies them, that means they're going to be kicked out of rehab. And they don't want to be kicked out of rehab because does anyone know what the next facility they could be sent to would be? Yeah, right, SNP. Or the new term they're calling it, the TCUs. Has anyone seen them called TCUs yet? So TCUs are transitional care units. They're doing that because they don't like the term nursing facility because nursing facility means old folks home, right? We've gone from calling them nursing homes, to calling them SNFs. Now they're trying to transition to this transitional care unit. Some of these SNFs and these TCUs will say that they are rehab facilities. In order to be a rehab facility, you have to be certified by Medicare and your patient has to get three hours therapy a day. How much therapy is required at a SNF? Believe it or not, you're going to be surprised. None. They're not required to have any therapy to go to a SNF. Now, most, the minimum they'll say is usually about 30 minutes. Kaylee's exactly right. But they're not required. We can just send them to a SNF to die, basically. Right? So again, so home's the best. 
Next is kind of an inpatient rehab facility. And we're going to talk about various di divisions of going home as well in a second. And we have the SNF TCU, right? It is system fail. It's hundred percent. It's why people go there and then get stuck there, right? Because here's the deal. There's a big difference between 30 minutes and three hours of therapy. When you think about that, isn't there a huge difference in those skill levels? And in the SNF, and I think if I remember correctly, Kaylee works at a SNF at this point, if I remember correctly. In the SNF, it's really common for patients to lose, you work rehab, okay. It's really common for patients to lose their therapy because they're not meeting their rugs. And we'll talk about the resource utilization groups next semester when we talk about insurance. If the patient's not meeting their rugs, their insurance carriers can pull their rehab which kind of stinks because those patients need that. So then maybe the patient is gonna be in a case where they need the same level of care that's in a hospital, but they're gonna need it for an extended period of time. Does anyone know what that's called? So the same level, of, yes, LTAC. long-term acute care, right? Right down the road from the school is one of pretty big LTAC. Uh, Kindred facility has an LTAC right on Flamingo, right? So long-term acute care, that means they're gonna have similar care to what they'd have in the hospital, but they're no longer in that acute phase. They're no longer in that first two to three weeks of care. You know, maybe this is a coma patient. Maybe this is a stroke that we know is just gonna decline because maybe it's a basal ganglia stroke or maybe it's a pond stroke. We'll talk about those when we talk about strokes. But long-term acute care is where the patients basically be sent because they still need same care in the hospital, but, and they're not ready to go anywhere else, right? So they need that one-on-one -on -one nursing care, which really isn't truly one-on-one, -on -one, but you get my point. Um, so that's kind of looking at where we're going out of the base. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, good. I'm gonna break out my little eraser here. And we're gonna erase. It's a fun new toy. I like this. Don't ever give me toys. I have fun with them. Yeah, use my little pencil. Erase it all away. It's just like a whiteboard. I draw a little better on this than I do on a whiteboard anyway. Let's go with a different color setup. Let's go with this color setup. All right. So now let's talk about home. So you say your patient is safe enough to go home. Now when they go home, there's a couple options we have as far as therapy is concerned, right? The first is we can send them home with no rehab. So no rehab services. They don't need therapy, they don't need PT, they don't need OT. This patient is a superstar rock star, right? This is the patient you went to see after having this hip fracture fixed and you come in to see them day two after they've been eval. And the patient's like, let's get up and walk. And man, they pop right up out of bed and down the hall, they truck. And you have them do exercises and they're like in there, like Russell, uh, not Russell Simmons. Um, Russell Simmons is different. Yeah, Russell Simmons, right? The exercise guy. And they're just chugging along, man. They don't need therapy. They are self-motivated. You know, they're going to stick to their home exercise program and they're good. Very Richard Simmons. Thank you, Anthony. Russell Simmons is the other guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, they don't need rehab services because they're just motivated. They're one of those people that are motivated. That is your golden goose. You're not going to get them very often, right? But they do happen. You can also send them home with home health PT. Right? So you can send them home with home health PT. 
why, what do you think the specific requirement for home health PT is? Other than none, but it should. In Pennsylvania, they had a requirement for this. Either live far away where they can't get the therapy good, right? And there's one other one. They can't do what? Can't drive. Yeah, that's the major one. So typically home health will say they can't drive or they have no one to drive them. Now with Uber and everything else nowadays, we've kind of taken away that excuse because there's even, I don't know if you guys have looked on your Uber apps lately, but there's even an Uber now that you can select that says requires special assistance. And they hire drivers that have skill in transferring patients and taking them to medical care and stuff like that. And some of the insurance providers are providing up to like $250 a year worth of um, driving expenses. So you literally get to drive Miss Daisy, the insurance, exactly that side hustle commercial, right? Now at Home Health PT, I'm going to tell you personally, I only want to see them for about two weeks if I can, because I don't have any cool toys in Home Health. I mean, I have some weights, I have some TheraBan. But I don't have stuff like an EMG machine. I don't have stuff like a, um, a TENS unit. It's pretty rare that I can get them at a home health PT. So it's better for that patient to end up going to the next level, right? Which is outpatient PT. Outpatient PT is pretty much what everyone thinks of when they think of PT, right? It's your Kelly Hawkins. It's your Matt Smith slash ATIs, it's your Edwin Suarez PTs. It's all those usual therapies, things to think about. It's, you know, that you, it's just the, the basic place that you go, you get your therapy and you go home, right? Now outpatient PT, how often do you think they're gonna get outpatient PT on average? What do you think? Well, I'll pay two to three times a day would be great. Yeah, two to three times a week is probably about closer, right? So two to three times a week. I mean, if we can get a patient that we can get every day, fantastic. Right? And some insurances will do that. Most insurances won't. I, I, I always tell the story of the patient that I had that had the bilateral arthrodesis. So both of his ankles fused. It was a post-polio patient, older gentleman. Um, he had a Mara group, which you guys will find really quickly when you go out in the world that a Mara group is one of the less PT-friendly insurance carriers. So he has a Mara group, and guess how many visits a Mara group approved him for? Yeah, I would love four. He, they approved them for one. One therapy visit, the eval. That's it. To learn how to walk with fused ankles. Right? So sometimes we get the golden gooses where we get them every day or four times a week, but most of the times we're not getting that. Most of the times we get maybe two to three times a week. Um, sometimes only one time a week. What else can affect the patient's ability to come to outpatient PT? Well, do they have a ride to outpatient PT? That's another thing. They're copays. What happens if you have a $150 copay for outpatient? Are you likely to go three times a week? Think about that for yourself right now. Yeah, no. And copays are just going up and up. Like I remember when I way back when when I worked in IT. I was mad when my um, PT copay went from $5 to $10 a visit. That doubled my copay, gosh darn it. And nowadays it's nothing for copays to be 50 bucks for PT, 75 bucks. Um, some of the VA copays, when you see somebody that's a VA patient that's got TRICARE and they're being seen in an outpatient non-VA facility, TRICARE may say a $75 copay. There is another kind of weird option 
that we don't think about a lot, which is outpatient rehab facility. Now, some, both Summerlin and Mountain View have this. I think Summerlin is a little bit more aggressive in this. But what an outpatient rehab facility is, they're still required to get three hours of therapy a day. And they're still required to get two disciplines. Right? But they get to go home. So they come in for their therapy, they come in and get their three hours of therapy. And then once they're done with their three hours of therapy, they go home. This really sounds ideal, doesn't it? Think about it, because that's the best of both worlds. We know patients get better when they get home, for the most part. Some people don't. For the most part, patients get better when they're in their normal setting. We know they get better when they have more therapy. So the more therapy we can get them, the more frequently they have therapy, the longer they have therapy, the better they're gonna get. So now we send them home, but they also still get three hours of therapy a day. That is fantastic. It's pretty rare that we get this lately just because most patients can't tolerate that three hours of therapy. But it can really speed along some of this. Maybe you got a stroke, like say maybe, I don't know, the patients got a, had a stroke and their family members at home are doctors and nurses. Great, we can send that patient home because they're gonna get the appropriate care at home, but we can still bring them in for their rehab for three hours a day. The more therapy a patient gets, it correlates highly to how fast they get better. Study after study has shown this. The more therapy a patient gets, the better they get, right? So, you know, Zach breaks his ankle. If he can get therapy five days a week, he's more likely to get better faster. And we can see this when we look at things like the NFL, right? Think about this for a second. Because I, I think of like Adrian Peterson is an excellent example of this when he played for the Vikings. Adrian Peterson tore his ACL. Came back the next season, tore his other ACL. Was able to come back at the end of the season and finish as the running back for the, the Vikings. Well, why is that? Well, he moved, home, he moved a physical therapist into his home with him. And he was getting seven to eight hours of physical therapy a day. Now, not all of us have that ability, right? Yeah, think about how, right? Think about if somebody had a stroke, how better they could get if they could get, a, have a therapist in home with them. Nice. Yeah, you can, that's probably, you're probably correct. I'm not sure which one you went to, but it's probably is considered officially an outpatient rehab facility. And again, the more they can receive that care, the better they are. So many subplot in Breaking Bad. I did not know that. I've never actually, believe it or not, I have never seen Breaking Bad. Although I have Although I have lived in an area that is essentially Breaking Bad territory, I've never watched Breaking Bad. I don't need to see what it's like because I lived it. Um, do, does that make sense for discharging? It, I know it's a great Michelle. It's, I, I don't doubt that. So let's do some brainstorming here. And we're gonna play, uh, let's think through this. Let's change my colors again. We're gonna go with blues. So we have a patient that is 75 years old and had an MCA right stroke. That's okay, I, I didn't realize it had PT in it. It's fantastic. So we've got a patient that's a 75 year old, we'll say male, that's had a right stroke. So they come into the inpatient facility and they're seen in the inpatient facility. And again, most strokes are gonna be seen BID, 
twice a day while they're in the, the, the hospital. We go to see them the first day after the PTZ valve. Them. We have to start thinking how safe they are right off the bat. So what are some of the things we're going to watch safety-wise? What are some of the things we're looking for? Balance, good. Right, we want to look at their balance. How steady their gait is, right? Their cognitive ability, great. What about their transfers? Do we want to check those out? Yeah, their motor skills, right? Their independence level. All right, we want to see how independent they are. How are they able to do most of their stuff? What about knowing their home situation? Yeah, what if you've got a stroke that's a hoarder? Or maybe a stroke, he's not the hoarder, but the wife is. And maybe the wife doesn't hoard newspapers and all that stuff, but instead hoards animals. Right, so she's got five goats, three pigs, 47 cats, 12 dogs, right? And they all live indoors and a couple rats and a partridge in a pear tree. And the pear tree is in the house because it grew through the house, right? That's important. And you guys will, if you're interested in this, you guys can do home assessments. PTAs are able to do that. Where before we discharge a patient, we're going to go home with the family and assess the home. Find out if it's safe enough for the patient to go home to, right? You, Irene did that. As, I, I enjoy those because you're almost like Sherlock Holmes at that point. You're walking around the house trying to figure out what could hurt the patient, right? You know, what if you go home with the wife and the wife's like, oh yeah, we've got to climb in through the second story window to get to the house. What, wait, what? Yeah, we use the fire escape and get up to the deck on the back window. Then we crawl in through the window because we can't go through the front door anymore. That might be a problem. Right? Or you go into their house and suddenly you're looking at their house and they've got, you know, 36 stairs to get to their second floor. It's a difference, right? So there's a lot of things we're going to take into account with this patient to see where they're going. So you look at this patient, they're not really steady on their feet. Their cognition's there. They're not the best, but their cognition is there. Motor skills are still weak on that affected side. So that left side is still pretty weak. Independently, they're mod assist for most of their activities. So that means they're doing about 50%, you're doing about 50% for them. At home, they have a fairly, home, fairly normal home situation, but the wife is 75 years old. Do you think that's gonna be safe to send that patient home? Think critically about this. Good, Michelle says no. I would tend to agree, right? When I see a moderate assist, I automatically start thinking, are they going to a rehab or a SNP? Because a moderate assist, most patients family can't tolerate, right? Because mod assist is up to you doing 75% of the work for them. And you have a 75 year old, Mimi Millie is, you know, 75 years old and all of 65 pounds soaking wet. And her husband's, you know, an ex football player. She's not gonna be able to transfer and they don't have room for lifts. So it's probably better that maybe they go to an inpatient rehab facility. So let's see, so now we're going, okay, so he can't go home. We'll call this guy, Joe. That was really bad writing. His name is Joe. So Joe can't go home. What are our, what are our next two options? Where, where, is he bad enough to go to an LTAC? Let's go there. No. Right, he's modest, so he's able to do most of his stuff. He doesn't necessarily need full nursing care at that point. So now we're down to which two choices. 
I said them already. We're down to rehab or sniff. Okay. So what's going to make our decision on where we send him? If he can tolerate what? Yeah, the hours of therapy, right? You know, so maybe we see Joe and he can only take a 30 minute session of therapy twice a day. Man, that's rough. He's not ready to, he's not, he's not ready to go to sniff or ready to go to rehab. Now, he could go to a sniff, get a little bit better, and then go to rehab. There's nothing that says the sniff can't transfer into a rehab facility. They usually don't, but there's nothing that says he can't. Right? So maybe he's just not strong enough. So then we're going to send him to sniff. Now let's get let's play a little devil's advocate here. Now you're seeing Joe at the inpatient facility, and Joe can tolerate about two hours of therapy a day. So Joe's pretty good. He's tolerating two hours of therapy. Are you willing to go to bat for him to send him to outpatient or inpatient rehab? What do you think? What then is going to come into play? Yes, there it is. That's exactly the right phrase, Eric. It depends upon how much he wants it. What's his motivation? If he's all doom and gloom, Oh, I'm never going to get better. He's basically a walking Eeyore. He's never going to get that extra hour. Right? But man, he's gung-ho. I'm ready to rock and roll. I want to get home because I want to take care of Millie. I miss Millie. I miss Millie and her 47 cats. I miss Joe. I miss John Oliver. I miss Stephen Colbert. And they named their cats after all the, the night show talk hosts talk show hosts, right? He's got to drive, send him to rehab. Better than that. Does that make sense on the thought process? Does that help you kind of see through it? All right, let's try one other thing here and let's throw a curve wrench in here, a curve ball in here. Now we're seeing Joe, Joe's had a stroke, but and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. He's had a stroke, he's RLA level one, meaning he only responds to painful stimuli and he's pretty well comatose. Where are we sending him? Maybe hospice, if he's end of life, that's a possibility. Yeah, now we're sending him, we're starting to think LTAC. Right, we're really starting to think, oh boy, right? Now the downside to that is in is gonna come the uh, case manager And we're going to say that this case manager works for Medical South. Now let's not say Medical South. Let's say Medical North Rehab. And her job is to fill the beds in the rehab facility. You think she's going to try to take this patient, even though it's not the most appropriate? It happens. Exactly. And now that puts a huge burden on all of the staff. Because now we've got a comatose patient that we've got to get three hours of therapy out of. And I'm sorry, I've done therapy at LTAX. Irene had that. Yeah, it's not very much fun, is it, Irene? Um, it's, it's kind of, it's very disheartening because what are you going to do three hours of sitting at the edge of bed and do a Hoyer lift, right? And all that's not an appropriate patient for rehab. 
So always be thinking about that. I know the case managers eventually, case managers is a new term for it. They used to be called social workers. I know their job is to get the, the you know, to fight for the best for the patient, but we need to be very firm in our kind of our standing is to say this patient is not safe enough for that, right? Get to know your case managers. And if you're ever in a hospital, you know, I used to smooth them a little bit when I was the director of rehab at one of my hospitals. And I always made sure that about once a week they got lunch. Because that way I made sure that my patients, when I told them they needed to go here, they fought for me and said that patient needs to go to rehab. That patient can't go to rehab. Um, but get to know them. We'll stop screen sharing here. All right. So welcome back to seeing my smiling face. Are there any questions about today's lecture? So let's do a quick, let's do a quick review. I am in the home health setting. What functional assessment am I going to have to do? Right. So start thinking of the wonder wall. You're going to do the OASIS. I'm working at the pediatric inpatient setting. What functional assessment am I going to do? This is the, my favorite one because I love that it's called. WEFIM. The P, we can do the PDMS, we can, but typically we're going to do the WEFIM in the inpatient until we get them a little bit better. And then we'll do the PDMS once we kind of get them an outpatient. The WEFIM. I just like the name of it, that's all. That's why I like wanted to say it. Because it's a WEFIM. Yeah, I know, I'm broken. Does that kind of understand, you see how difficult this is, right? This is not something easy for PTs. I do not begrudge them one bit for getting frustrated sometimes. Uh, it just, it's an amazing amount of work they have to go through in order to get these patients discharged to the appropriate locations. And, you know, they've got to remember that they did a FIM at the beginning of the treatment session with the patient or the first time the patient saw it, so they have to do another FIM at the end. We have to help them with that, right? We have to be kind of their eyes and ears. We have to kind of keep track of when that patient needs a reevaluation. We have to keep track of, you know, what kind of special tests we need to run on that patient in order to keep them going. And sometimes that's going to come into play of learning the insurances, Nobody likes to learn the insurances, no one, but we have to do it. We have to be our patient's best advocate because the more we can advocate for the patient, the more likely they are to refer people to us, right? If you're in an outpatient setting, if, you're, if your clinic is not working off of referrals, you're missing a huge, huge, huge chunk of patients. The happier you make your patients, the more likely they're to refer their friends, neighbors, cousins, nephews, everything to your clinic. It's a huge referral source, right? I had a bad experience at two hospitals in the Valley. I am not likely to go back to those two hospitals because I had a bad experience, right? Even if I'm getting in an ambulance, I'm gonna make sure that they're not taking me to one of those two hospitals. So that's huge, right? That comes back into these assessments, that comes back in. Then the last assessment we kind of have to talk about and then I'll let you go. The last assessment that you guys are gonna deal with and it's only come about recently is your provider ratings. Now, good news is for PTs and PTAs, we don't have individual provider ratings like doctors have. I don't know if you guys know this, but every doctor that takes Medicare you can go and look up their provider ratings based upon patients that have filled out surveys on these doctors, right? And it can tell you if you wanna to go to that doctor or you don't wanna to go to that doctor. But we will get rated. Almost every patient that leaves an inpatient facility, 
an inpatient rehab facility, an outpatient rehab facility, even outpatient world, we will send them surveys to complete. The downside to that is who is more likely to complete the survey, the happy patient or the unhappy patient? Yeah, the unhappy patient, right? Think about it. You got the, a bad raw deal at McDonald's. You're going home, you're going, I'm typing out a review on you, right? I've actually had patients that have come into inpatient facilities where I'm seeing them and I walk in and they're like, I just want to let you know, I am a Yelper. Great. I will be Yelping about your visit. And I've actually had patients, patients that are documenting as I'm treating them. We did really well. There's a great, yeah, there is a great episode in South Park about that. You're exactly right. So it happens. How do you keep your surveys up? How do you keep the rehab department surveys up? You make sure you understand, explain to the patient that they're probably going to get a survey. I do this all the time. I explain them. They're going to get a survey. Please rate me, rate our therapy on what we did for you, not what the hospital did for you. Right? They're likely to remember, right, and encourage patients. If they're very pleased, fill out those surveys. Please, it's important. I tell them it's important for our reimbursement because as we move along in this Medicare process, our reimbursement is going to be tied to these patients completing these surveys. So the better our, our survey results are, the more likely we are to get higher reimbursement. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, it's even tied down to our license, where every single one of us has a record at Medicare. And you know, I get reimbursed at, you know, Adrian's out there, he's a licensed PTA now, and he's got a 5.7 out of six rating, and I'm down there and I'm down in like the threes. Well, he's getting a 90% reimbursement while I'm getting a 45%. Which, who do you think facilities, let's be real, six out of six, I love it. That's the way to think, right? But when, you come to, when it comes to hiring, facilities are gonna look at those records and they're gonna be more likely to hire him over me. I credit one of the reasons why I get job offers at times for PTAs is because I bring patients with me. I sometimes think they just follow me out of morbid curiosity but I bring patients with me, right? I, you know, if I go to a new pediatric place, my pedi a lot of my pediatric patients follow me. And I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm a giant kid and the kid gets along with me. There is a lot, a lot to do with that in pediatric settings, but you'll see that. You guys will bounce from clinic to clinic and you'll have patients that follow you. Now, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for creepy reasons, but they will follow you. And that can be a real benefit, right? It's important to let them know they need to fill their surveys out. It's important to let them know that if they have a problem, not necessarily to fill it out on the survey, let me fix it, right? I always tell that patient, if there's something that you can't rate me good on, let me know. Because that means I, it gives me a chance to grow. And I want to improve that, right? I really, I love your, when you guys fill out surveys at the end of the semesters, you may think that I don't look at them. I am like hyper-focused on them. I use those and integrate the feedback you give me to make me a better instructor. Same thing at the clinic. All right, so I'm gonna stop recording here. Are there any questions before I stop recording? Okay, I'm gonna stop.